Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is get ready to meet the gray, great gray whales of Baja. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Sophia Marino. Sophia, thank you so much for being here today. It's it's wonderful to see you here again. It's been too long and I just can't wait to visit Baja with you for the next hour. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you for the presentation and uh, welcome, welcome all of you. Um, and let's just let's just go straight ahead and, and dive into this presentation. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of introduction about myself. And then I'm going to go through some pictures, some uh, general information about the gray whales. And of course, I'm going to go through the itinerary that we do. And at the end, any questions, um, please, I'm happy to answer those. So um, to start, I'm going to, to present a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in a city in Guadalajara, Mexico. It's a big city, uh, but I've always wanted to study marine biology since I can remember. And in order to do that, I moved to La Paz, uh, which is in the Baja California Peninsula, where I live now. I currently live here. I study here, I live here, and then when I'm not working in other places, this is this is my home. Um, in marine biology, I specialize in the study of large whales. Um, I worked in the Sea of Cortez and in the site in the Pacific side also of the Baja California Peninsula. And for many years now, I've been working with the gray whales in San Ignacio Lagoon, the place that we go and, and visit, and in other places also uh, here in the, in the Baja Peninsula. So um, I'm going to share also why San Ignacio Lagoon is, is so special for me and why I keep uh, coming back year after year. So um, these following pictures are just some you know, general images of this amazing gray whales uh, that we're going to, to get to see really up close um, in San Ignacio Lagoon. Here we have on the left, a mama and a calf traveling together. Um, and then on the right, the calf is the one that is on top of, of the mom. Um, and yeah, they, they look kind of a strange, you know, a little bit bizarre, the, the rostrum, but this is the gray whale. If this is your first time seeing some pictures up close, um, yeah, they do, they do look a little bit strange. And right now the gray whales are actually still migrating. Um, so if you live in the west coast of the US, maybe you've heard of them that they are doing the migration and they are coming uh, south to Mexico. This is another picture of the of the gray whales doing, you know, this this travels, this migration. And then uh, eventually when they arrive to Mexico, um, this is a picture that is taken on the field in one of the pangas. The, this is how we call the boats that we take when we go out to see them. And this is again a mom and a calf in a really perfect weather condition day that uh, not every day is like that, but this is, you know, a great picture just to show that it can be like that also. But let's go a little bit back, okay? And let's go to, to the beginning of where are these uh, gray whales coming from, okay? So uh, when they are not here in Mexico in their summer month, summer month, sorry, they are going to be up in the Bering Sea in the North Pacific, uh, extending all the way actually to the Kamchatka Peninsula of Russia right here. Um, and then they are going to spend their time feeding as much as they can, because when they come to Mexico, they are not eating uh, here in Mexico, okay? So in this area, the menu is going to be little, little crustaceans that are called amphipods. They are stuck in the mud. Um, here you can see a, a picture of the gray whale um, eating from the bottom. They, they, they remove, they move the, the mud from the bottom and they are going to do like some suction, you know, to get all of this crazy looking small crustaceans that you see here in the picture on the right um, and this is this is their diet this is the main menu up there in the north pacific um, and again they are there in the summer okay so after the summer around september october they are going to start the migration and they're going to start moving south 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 they're going to pass all of canada that i took out of this map 
sorry for that. Um, and then they continue their journey. They continue migrating really close to the shore. They are coastal um, migratory animals, okay? They stick really close to the shore. They continue their trip all the way, eventually to crossing the border between San Diego and uh, Tijuana to arrive here to the Baja California Peninsula, okay? And uh, this migration that you can, that I show you, uh, just to, to show some facts and some numbers about it, people always ask me, what is the time, you know, and what's the length of this, of this migration? And some of the studies have shown that from the Arctic to the Baja California Peninsula, uh, a gray whale that was with a tag uh, migrated 60, in 66 days, 5,000 miles. And this is just one way. They spend their time down here and then they have to go back another 5,000 miles north. So in average, we always say that it's a 10,000 miles round trip uh, for these large whales. Pretty, pretty impressive. Um, they are slow uh, migratory animals around three miles per hour. You know, when they are, when they are going fast, this would be kind of their, their time. Um, and we know that for the females and calves, the moms and their calves, they travel even slower because the calf is smaller, needs to take breaks, needs to spend a little bit more time in the surface, breeding, and it is not that fast. With this, you know, that I mentioned the calves, some of the calves are not born in Mexico. They are born when they are in the migration, especially around the south of the, of the US, okay? Um, so, but eventually, you know, they make it where? To the Baja California Peninsula that you can see on this map right here. This is the whole peninsula. To pinpoint uh, some good, you know, some good facts about it. We have two states in the Baja California Peninsula. We see a line right here in the middle uh, that divides the two states. We have Baja California in the north here, and then we have Southern Baja California here. So where we go to visit, where the gray whales come is actually to the state of Southern Baja California, okay? Where I live is La Paz that you can see right here in the map, okay? And I live in the Sea of Cortez, but the gray whales come to the Pacific side of the Baja California Peninsula. But a little bit more specific here, I'm showing you in this map, just the Southern state, right? Baja California Sur is how we say it in Spanish. And we have the three different lagoons where the gray whales come. We have in the north, Guerrero Negro, also known as Scammons Lagoon. Then we have in the middle right here, San Ignacio Lagoon, which is the place that in this particular trip we visit. And then we have in the south, Magdalena Bay Complex. So these are the three different breeding and mating lagoons that the gray whales visit in our winter here in Mexico, okay? But of course, naturally, the question would be why? Why they make this journey? Why they come all the way here? Or actually, where does everything start? Um, it's for me always a fun question to, to think of that in Mexico, we always say they, they are coming from the North, but actually they are born here. So they go to the North and then they come back home. This is a nice way to, to you know, just to change that perspective. So one of the reasons why they come here is to mate. Uh, here in this picture, we have three um, large whales. We assume that one is a female and two are males because that's usually how it goes uh, with the mating of these animals. And uh, they do something that we call promiscuous mating. So this means that the female just wants to get pregnant and there's going to, she's going to mate with multiple uh, males and she's going to get pregnant at the end. Who's the, who's the father? We don't really know, but the important thing is that uh, she is pregnant at, at the end of, of this, okay? So this would be one type of behavior that we could totally see in, um, in our visit when we go to the lagoon, which is an amazing behavior. Um, when we see the mating, uh, we see a lot of flukes, a lot of thrashing the flukes, a lot of movement, a lot of commotion in the surface. Because for, luckily for us, the gray whales um, tend to mate in the surface because they need to take breaths. It's so active that it's better to stay there in the surface, right? Um, to keep breathing um, with all of this action. 
so we tend to see a lot of flukes, a lot of commotion in the surface. Um, sometimes we see some whales breaching. Uh, they don't. They are not that acrobatic compared to, for example, the humpback whale. But they do breach. They do, you know, bring their bodies out of the water. Half of the body, sometimes just the rostrum. And this is another type of behavior that we could see in the lagoons for sure. Um, a little bit more of of the same. This is a big, large whale. Um, and why these lagoons, right? Why to come here to mate specifically in these lagoons? And there are different different theories about it. Um, one of it is that the more the better, right? If you have a great concentration of whales in a specific area, then this is really good as a genetic mixing in this population because you have so many different opportunities for these not opportunity, so many different options, let's say genetic options for these females to mate with this, with them uh, and for the males to mate with, with the female. So I always um, kind of, you know, joke, jokingly just say it is like going to Friday night at the bar. There are a lot of options, right? So that's a good thing. I'm sorry if you're hearing some of the dogs barking um, is a little bit loud sometimes in my house. Sorry for that. Um, so anyway, this is one of the reasons why we believe that they, they come to these lagoons, you know, because it's a greater concentration of them. They choose this spot also because it's nice and calm and 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 shallow. Actually, these lagoons are, are quite shallow. They're coastal lagoons. They are not deep. Maximum depth is going to be around 20 meters, around 60 feet. So it's not that deep. And it makes it perfect for the moms to give birth um because the gray whales they are a prey of the orcas um when they are migrating south and when they are migrating north uh, because as i mentioned before some of the females are already traveling with their calves um and then of course when they go north even though the calf is is bigger because it spent their the winter here in mexico um it is still a really nice prey a nice catch and an easier catch for these orcas um, so uh, another point to why go to these lagoons, they are shallow, they're protected. Um, we do have orcas outside of the lagoons and for many years, no one ever saw or registered orcas inside of the lagoons until two years ago, actually. Uh, they, they were not preying on the, on the gray whales, they were preying on dolphins that we have inside of the lagoon. But that was the first time in all of our knowledge, fisherman knowledge, scientific knowledge of the orcas being inside of the of the lagoons. But for many years, it was believed that the orcas um, didn't go in because they didn't have the, the space, probably, you know, the deep space for them to quietly hunt the, the gray wolves. But we're going to see how that story turns in the, in the future if they come back. But anyway, so it's a relative protected you know, um, space for the moms to give birth to this to these calves. So that's another reason why we believe that uh, the gray whales um, are doing this type of behavior, burden and calving in in Mexico. Um, so some specific numbers about this: uh, the moms are going to to be pregnant uh, for around a year. Uh, so they get pregnant in Mexico, right, in the winter, and then they go to feed in the Arctic, and then they come back, this is one year later, to give birth, okay? So they get pregnant here, and also they give birth here. Um, most of the time, the, the, the mean calving date is going to be around January 10, which it makes it perfect for our trips when we go to San Ignacio Lagoon, which is in February. February is the peak of the peak of the season um, of all sorts of different activities, and we could see a little bit of everything. So the calves are not that tiny, they're not newborns, and the moms are exploring a little bit more of the lagoons, they're traveling with their calves, they, and for us, it makes it a little bit better to see them because the moms are not, are not that protected of their calves because they're already a little bit grown, okay? Um, so the, the calves are going to stay with their mom for the duration of their stay in Mexico, and they're going to travel together back to their Arctic uh, feeding grounds, and then they're going to separate um, over there. And that's it. That's the end of their, of their time together. So in total, between six to seven months that the calf is going to stay with, with, their, with their mom. 
Um, this is a picture just to show, you know, the transition of we have a pregnant uh, female here all the way up and then the picture in the middle with a newborn calf. And you can see when they are making the migration back together, how big this calf is, how much it has grown and how, for me, I always think of the female. She hasn't been feeding since she left the Arctic. She could be snacking here and there. Sometimes they do that and we call that snacking when they stop if there's an opportunity to feed on something uh they they can you know do that and they've been seen in other places outside of the arctic to to eat um here and there and and it's 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 quite a, a stress right for the energy cost of of this female but uh she manages and she's decreasing of course in the weight but the calf is if is waning sorry gaining that weight that the mom is, is losing. And, and I think this progression of pictures uh, shows that perfectly. Here are uh, some, here is, sorry, another nice picture of, of moms and calves. And just to show how tactile they are. The, the gray whales, uh, when they are in these lagoons, the mom is bonding with the calf. Um, they never leave the calf. They are always together. Sometimes the mom could be resting and you may thinking, where is the calf? But the calf is always going to be around that, that female. And they are really touchy animals. In the rostrum, we call that area here, like the front of the, of the head, um, they have little tiny hairs and they are really tactile animals, as I mentioned. They are sensitive, uh, those, those little kind of... Uh, uh, whiskers, if, if you may think of something relative to that. And they, so they spend a lot of time together rolling on top of mom. And, and this makes it so special for us, uh, you know, as travelers to go and witness this type of behaviors, uh, the, these bonding moments between the mom and, and, and the calf. For me, this is one of my favorite things to see when we are um, in San Ignacio Lagoon for sure. So this is a, a satellite picture of San Ignacio Lagoon. And to some, they, they say that it looks like a whale, which is a little bit interesting. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is uh, the whole coastal lagoon uh, in the south here in the lower part. This is the entrance uh, that communicates to the Pacific. And this is why we call it a coastal lagoon. It only has one way to go in, same way uh, to use it when you go out. And the lagoon is divided into different different parts, you know, the north end, the upper, the middle, and the lower. And only from this area here, uh, actually, the, let me just go first to the, to the star that you see here. This star is where Kuyima Camp is located. This is a whale camp also, we call it uh, the camp that we go and we stay at. It is uh, right here. It is one of eight camps that are located in the lagoon that only the locals actually have the rights of the land and uh, which is an amazing way of, of working with the locals and we have this partnership with um, Kuyima camp for many many years we've been visiting this camp for more than 25 years actually um, so anyway this is where we stay and then we travel from this place to this line here in the south and from this line, all the way to the opening of the mouth of the lagoon, it is the whale watching area. So if you divide again, it's in two parts. Uh, one, only one fourth of the lagoon is where we can do the whale watching. Everything else is protected for the whales. And the whales do hang out here in this area. And then they go outside to Ballenas Bay, which is this bay that is outside but only in the lower area of the lagoon is where we can do the whale watch, okay? And it's heavily regulated actually. Only 16 boats are allowed to be inside of the lagoon at the same time. And we have 90 minutes inside of the whale watching area. So the times that it takes, it takes us from the camp to this line doesn't count. The time starts counting once you cross the line and you are spending your time here. We are not missing much. Honestly, a lot of the activity happens here. I always talk to the researchers, uh, colleagues of, of mine in the, in the past, actually, um, that when they are doing their census, when they're doing the monitoring of the whales, uh, most of the time, the cool things happen right here. 
because as I mentioned before, the rest of the lagoon is shallow. So it is, they don't have a lot of space to go to. Only in the high tide, they can use more of the lagoon. And in the low tide, they use the middle channel. Actually, and here, there are two other channels that they can use the whales to be because of physical space. Um, so the moms with their calves, when they give birth, they tend to do it in the upper or north end of the lagoon, which is way more quiet and nice for them. And that's why also we cannot go uh, to this area because it's protected for them. So yeah, this is just some of the, you know, explanation of how they divide the lagoon and how um, the area is used and, and all of this. So let's go to the next picture here. Uh, this is a picture that was taken uh, from a guest a few, I think it's like three seasons ago, um, from the perspective of, of of the other boat, we always go out. Uh, the group is 16 guests, and we divide into two different boats, uh, guided by two ELs. So I'm here, and then my co-guide was in the other boat, the boat that took this picture, and this is a, a whale calf. So really nice perspective of, you know, what the the calf could be seeing or thinking by looking at a bunch of people with cameras and phones and things staring at this calf you know so to me it's always nice to think of the of the other of the perspective of, of the other so nice nice picture right there so um we're going to go now into the specifics of this particular itinerary and um i i am showing you a map of the northern part of the state of Southern Baja California, uh, just to show where we start and where we go. So Loreto is the place that we start. Okay, uh, Loreto has an international airport. So all of our guests arrive to Loreto and they are flights that are coming from multiple cities from the States. That being said, uh, it's not like there's a huge, huge offer because it's a small airport in a small community. It's a beautiful town, perfectly safe, uh, really nice to arrive earlier and have some days to explore Loreto, to explore the Gulf of California or the Sea of Cortez and the islands, because in front of Loreto, it's a, it's a protected uh, marine park with five different islands and excursions to, to go to actually, to snorkel, to dive, uh, to try to see some blue whales. Uh, they don't make it easy, but, it's, but they are there also. So yeah, Loreto is a beautiful uh, town that I'm going to show a couple of pictures of the hotel and the town in a second. So this is where we start. And so we have the welcome dinner in Loreto and two nights, the first night in Loreto and then the last night before you depart is also in Loreto, okay? And then um, we go from Loreto in the day that we drive, which is day two of the itinerary, we take a big bus. I'm going to show you a picture of that also from Loreto all the way north. It's a beautiful road, a really scenic road. One of my best, one of the, my favorite places actually is when we're crossing this area here, Conception Bay. It's just stunning, the views from the bus. It is not a boring bus, even though it's six hours from Loreto all the way to San Ignacio town. We're going to share information. We're going of the local history, culture, natural history also. So I'm, it's not going to be a, a boring, bus ride i i promise that we have of course stops uh in the way uh biological stops and then uh, we pass santa rosalia town which uh, is a mining town we just pass it we don't spend any time there just the biological stop and that's it and then from there we turn right sorry left into the desert um to san ignacio town which is located in a oasis beautiful oasis here in San Ignacio town, we're going to transfer, we have a quick transfer into vans, and we take two vans from Cuyima that are going to take us into one hour and a half ride from San Ignacio town all the way to San Ignacio Lagoon. So we leave early in the morning in Loret from Loreto because we are going to go on our first well watch that same day. So we have to leave sharp as a clock, make it all the way to San Ignacio Lagoon to arrive leave our things and quickly the boats are, are uh, waiting for us and we go on our first whale watching excursion uh, that second uh, day, okay? And we're going to spend here three nights at uh, the Kuyima camp, beautiful location. 
Uh, we're going to have in total six whale watching excursions. We are always aiming for six whale watching excursions. Now, you have to always remember that this is our winter. We are in the Pacific side in a remote area in open plains. There's nothing to stop the wind. We don't have any mountains you know, in front of or next to San Ignacio Lagoon. So the wind just passes like you're opening you know, a door. So it's our windy season, it's our winter. So sometimes it can happen that maybe one will watch in excursions or maybe two are canceled. If we can make it, if we can, you know, have them the following day, the extra one that we didn't do, we're always going to try to do that. Uh, but everything depends with the timing and of course with the weather. Um, it is rare that we fully, fully cancel. The winds must be really bad, but for safety reasons, we always have that in mind, okay? So that's why, you know, we're always aiming to make this, say, six whale watching um, excursions. So we have one, the, the day that we arrive, two on the, in our first full day, another two on our second full day, and the last one, the day that we leave. The day that we leave, we have one last whale watching excursion, which is really nice because we go out, we see the whales, and then all the way, we come back to Loreto, we have our farewell dinner, and then the following day, you leave, okay? So as you can see, it's a short and tight itinerary, is six days with arrival and departure and four days uh, of real, um, you know, adventure, as I like to, to call it. So I hope that the itinerary is clear. And of course, if you have any questions, please um, let me know. So these are our accommodations. Uh, we stay in Loreto in Hotel La Mission. It's a beautiful hotel, the best in town, um, with a view of the ocean right here. It has a swimming pool that the water for me is cold. For me, everything is cold because I am a warm-blooded human being. But the jacuzzi is warm, which is really nice. So it's a nice place if you want to ride before and just, you know, uh, have a moment if, if, of your long travels. It's a really amazing place. And you can see here Loreto uh, Marina, actually, where the small boats depart for the excursions of, to go to the islands. Actually, they depart from there. So it's just walking distance from the hotel to the marinas. And then we have the Malecon, which is the boardwalk that extends. And it's a nice walk in the morning or in the afternoon also in town. This is a picture of this. This is the hotel, uh, the picture on the right here, on the up right. The hotel and then in the back you can see Loreto town and the mountains in the background also. And as I mentioned before, it's a really nice, calm, safe town of around high season. Um, 20,000 people live there and um, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. It's one of my favorite places actually of uh, the Southern Baja California. And this is a, a, a view of uh, how the room looks of this, of this hotel, okay? So uh, the other type of accommodations that will go is Kojima Camp. Kojima Camp is a rustic camp that is in the middle of the desert, of the open plains of the Vizcaino Desert, actually. And these are the little huts or cabanas, as we call them, that are just next to the, to the ocean, okay? And we have composting toilets and we have other toilets that do use a little bit of water. And everything here needs to be, we're in the desert, so we always have to be really aware actually of our water usage. And we have bucket showers. Bucket, by bucket showers, I mean it's a bucket that you go out, you fill it with warm water, uh, heated by a solar heater, here, heater. And then you take your bucket, and like in the old times with a cup, you're going to take your shower, like in the old days. There is no luxury in this camp. It's a rustic camp. It's a beautiful. These are the best accommodations uh, that we have in San Ignacio Lagoon. But honestly, it's a magic place. It's a magic place and you don't need much to be in one of these magic places. And inside here we have the bed. They have two small uh, beds in the, in the cabanas. And then they have an area where you can, you know, put your your things um, and your bags and all of that inside of the cabana. Also, um, important to note is that inside of the cabana, there is an emergency toilet. Uh, we call it emergency. It's because it's for the night. OK, 
and then for the days and we always recommend to use regular toilets that are outside of the cabana right in front of the of of this um, cabanas right here so a little bit of the food how things work in the camp is that we take orders in advance everything is uh, made from fresh um, it is not a restaurant, it's a dining, but we do have options and we do follow any dietary need or restriction that uh, you may have. We are going to, to provide always a, a good, safe, delicious option for you. Vegetarian options, vegan options, gluten-free options, all of that. But well, of course, we always do need everything in advance to, for, to have the camp you know, ready because we're in a remote, remote location. So it's not easy to to bring things to this camp and this is how it looks it's a beautiful palapa is it's a style of a building that we use um, in this part of the peninsula and the kitchen is an open kitchen in the back the staff is amazing we have the local staff the local guides uh, the kitchen ladies that are just fabulous of the things that they prepare for us that you can always see what they're cooking and ask them questions and practice your Spanish, of course, with them. Also, we have the, the bar area right here for drinks, margaritas, things like that, okay? So we go to local restaurants. Uh, we don't eat at the hotel because we always want to support um, extra, you know, more people in town and for the welcome orientation and for, sorry, for the welcome dinner and farewell dinner, we eat at two different restaurants uh, of the, of Loreto. So we support these local businesses with our groups and uh, Juan Carlos, the chef here at Mitas is always really accommodating and the owners also of um, Mi Loreto restaurant where we have the farewell dinner, they are fabulous. And we are here with Rosa, our local staff um, and some of our guests of, of this season enjoying a nice meal there in Loreto. As I mentioned before, we have local staff, we have uh, Maggie, which is the manager of the camp. She's from the lagoon. Everyone that works at the camp is from the lagoon, with the exception maybe of some of the local guides. They could be from the region, from the state. Then we have Irma, the head chef, has been working there for more than 20 years. Maggie has been working there for more than 15 years. And then our local captains also, that they are the ones that know how everything runs and how everything works over there, of course, at the lagoon. Here is to, for you to see a picture um, that I'm going to show a better one and explain how, you know, the pangas, which are the local boats work. OK, but just to see that we we have our local staff that are wonderful, of course. Um, of the transportation, we have uh, the bus. We have a big bus just for us, for 16 guests plus the two guides. So we have a lot of space. We always say everyone gets a window seat or two because there's more space that we need. Um, and the, the bus also has a restroom if you need, but as I mentioned, we have a biological stops um, and that's one means of transportation. The other one is going to be the pangas that I show you. That um, this is how we use them. If we have a high tide, this is with a high tide because it's a shallow lagoon. We have a big difference between low and, and high tide. And we use this ramp and the local staff, captains and us, we always help you to go in and out safely, of course. Um, but if the tide is low, the water that you see right here is going to be all the way behind this panga here. And it's so shallow that the pangas cannot come to the shore. And we have to get our feet uh, wet. and We have to shuffle our feet um, to get in the panga. So we have uh, wet or dry landings and we let you know, but it's always, always uh, good to, to bring those water shoes. Um, Tivas work perfectly or any other type of water shoe that you may think of, um, those are perfect. If you don't like to get your feet wet, we always recommend some boots, like rubber boots, for example, to the knee, because with those ones, you'll be, you'll be fine, okay? if you don't like to get your feet wet, but it's not a big problem. So what to bring, you know, um, we always say that for the day, your camera gear, for sure your binoculars, um, waterproof everything, waterproof jacket, please, waterproof jacket, pants, and the shoes, okay? 
um, maybe we have a perfect calm day and there is no much splashing or anything like that. Um, but we never know. The weather can change. In the lagoon, the weather changes. We can have all of the stations in one day. It's calm in the morning when we go out and then when we're coming back, suddenly is windy and things go, you know, we get, we are in the water, so we, we, we can get wet. So that's why it's always good to be ready with your waterproof layers. Um, we recommend some extra layers if you are someone that lives, for example, in Florida or in a warm place and you're not used to the cold places, bring your extra layers because with the wind, that's when we get really, really cold. And um, something that I've learned with my years guiding in this place is that guests tend to be surprised with how cold it is. So don't underestimate, we are, you're not going to tropical Mexico, you're going to the winter of this area that is pretty windy and is cold, okay? Just to have it in mind. Sunglasses, sunscreen, sun hat, we are in the desert, so that's always, of course, really important and the sense of adventure that can never, can never be missed. So this is just to show you an example of how the weather can be, okay? It uh, can be cloudy, cold, sunny, hot, windy and breezy, everything in the same day. This would be a regular kind of day in San Ignacio Lagoon, but definitely the temperature can drop down of, um, you know, lower than the 70s can go to the 60s uh, for sure, okay? So just, just have that in mind, okay? So, this is something that is really important because um, this trip, it is heavily focused on the gray whales. We are going to spend our time, the majority of our time, whale watching and going to these places. Apart from, this, from the whales, is there something else to see? And I always say yes. <laughs> the scenery is fabulous. The birds are really nice also. Um, if you're keen into birding, uh, one of our local guides, actually Maggie, loves birds. And we, of course, as, as EELs also uh, know about our local birds. Uh, but we are not going to spend the majority of the time looking for the birds. This is a trip for the gray whales. If we have time and the weather allows, we can offer, and sometimes we do that, um, going to the mangroves, right, to, to hopefully see some, some other birds. But this is weather dependent and if things aligned with our, our itinerary for the whale watchings, okay? So that's always that I always like to, to highlight. Um, apart from that, we do offer other activities also because we have times between whale watchings, okay, that we like to offer walks because we know that we're going to be sitting on a boat for three hours each time, okay? Um, because it's from the boat, the time that it takes to the whale watching area, plus the 90 minutes, and then the time which is around 15 minutes to come back. So in general, we always say around three hours that we're going to be in a boat. So of course we want to stretch our legs, of course we want to walk. And we do offer, you know, some walks here, but I wouldn't use the word hikes. They are walks to the mangroves, walks to the next camp, and it's all in a flat, um, even uh, ground, okay? Um, we also like to visit, um, if it's allowed, other little places that are around the lagoon. But again, this is depending on our itinerary with the wind and how things work. And we want to give you the best experience and for you to know San Ignacio Lagoon. And we are always going to, to do our best in managing, you know, this other visits and these other place, places. But as I always say, whales come first, okay? So with this, I am going to finish this presentation. Um, here are some pictures that I love. The one on the right, it was my very first not have trip that I guided in 2018 uh, with the Grey Wells of San Ignacio. I used to work there before, so I've been going to this place even before uh, I've been working with not have, but that this was my, my very first trip actually, so I always remember it. And then, this is again the perspective of the other perspective, maybe what the whale is, is seeing, you know, when they they approach uh, the, the boats, if we have friendly whales. So I hope that maybe some of your questions were answered. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me. But thank you very much for your attention. 
Sophia, thank you so much. Every time I see you talk about this itinerary, it just makes me salivate more and more. <laughs> it looks so, <laughs> so amazing. Um, we have thank lots you. of questions, but I do want to um, re re remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, do the whales feed at all during their migration? Do the whales feed on the migration? They don't. They, if if you open any textbook, any research paper that is out there, you're always uh, trying to find. We're always going to find that they do not feed on the migration. But we've been seeing. I've been seeing. Others have been seeing um, places and feeding behaviors uh, from the whales. But it's not something that we consider as fully eating. Maybe if there's some opportunity of them getting a little bit, they are going to try to do it, but they are not obtaining much. There are a group of uh, gray whales that are considered to be a little bit of residents that they don't migrate much around Oregon, for example, um, that they do stay in that area. But in general terms, um, they are fasting. The, the, the moms, especially I always think of the moms, they are fasting and they are pregnant, so they just want to get uh, south to, to give birth. Mm. Um, what date does the migration start in the north? That's a great question. Um, there isn't a specific day, like, you know, if I tell you September 15th, for example, because it's going to do to uh, any weather conditions that are triggering them. As the days are going to to start to get uh, shorter, the light is going to start to change. Um, it's like it's one of the triggers, you know, for them to start the migration. And it's not like all of them leave also at the same time. Um, usually, the whales that are pregnant, the future moms, they are the first ones that leave, and then with that, the males kind of follow, and then with that, the subadults and juveniles follow them. So there isn't a specific, you know, time. Um, in general terms, it's between September and October that kind of the migration could start, even though for some it could be a little bit before and some arrive late here. So I cannot give you just a number. That makes sense. <laughs> what kind of boats uh, will guests be on? Is it the boats that you see in the pictures? And then how would you keep cameras dry in situations like this? Yeah, perfect, perfect question. So uh, the boats that you're looking at, the picture that I left right there, those are the boats that we're going to be using. Those are the only boats that we can be using. Uh, those are the boats that the fishermen in the past used for fishing, that now they've been adapted and only used for um, the, the whale watching activities. And they, they are like a little skiff, you know, as you can see, they don't have any sun protection um, and, and the, the water, if we are moving fast, we, we tend to move fast from the camp to the whale watching area is a moment that we can get some splash if, if we have some rough conditions for sure. So the best way is when we are moving from point A to point B with a dry bag, have your camera in a dry bag, not a light dry bag. If you have a big camera or a, any small camera that you want to protect, please, a dry bag is the best, you put it there. And then once we reach the whale watching area, we're going to be moving, we're going to be moving slow with way less chances of getting wet. So then you can get it out, set to move, to take the pictures. If we are moving again, you know, faster and there's more chances of splashing with the conditions of the ocean, then of course I'll let you know. But um, I've had guests that they bring their heavy heavy cameras you know the big lenses the short lenses and they have one of you know their backpacks inside of a dry bag or if you have a phone and this is the thing that you're going to be taking pictures a small dry bag it is also nice excellent um are you able to see whales from camp i um i would say Yes, but it's not common. Um, mm -hmm. We can hear them sometimes at night, which if it's zero wind, uh, which is really, really cool. Um, I've seen them, but it is not that common. And I'll tell you why. 
the camp, it's right at the shore. And then we have a really long, shallow area uh, until we reach the channel of navigation for the whales. So physically, they cannot fit because it's so shallow for them. Shallow is two meters, six feet. So the whales mm. tend to be on that channel. And from that channel, we can see the, the sprays, you know, that are passing by, but we don't see them close. Uh, so hopefully with this is clear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you describe the amenities at camp? Yes. So, I mean, at camp, when, when you arrive at camp and we assigned you a cabana, um, I mean, in the cabana, you're going to find a face towel or a hand towel and, a, and also a regular towel for the shower, a big towel. Um, and then we always recommend that you bring your um, types of, you know, uh, shampoo or soap that are biodegradable. Those ones are for you to bring. Um, to For washing your hands, you know, the soap is there and all of that, but just for the shower, all the your toiletries that you need for the shower, those are things that you would need to, to bring. Um, and yeah, and I would say only the face or hand towel and the kind of big towel for the shower, that is, that, that's, those would be the, the amenities that are there available. Okay, excellent. Can you talk about interaction with the whales? Is swimming or touching, swimming with the whales or touching the whales permitted, encouraged? Um, so anything beyond what they might experience from the boat? Yes, so swimming with the whales, it is not allowed. Actually, all over Mexico, um, swimming with whales, it is something that is not allowed. And especially in San Ignacio Lagoon, in this sanctuary, it's protected by, it's a World Heritage Site, it's a bio biosphere reserve by the Mexican government. Um, so there's different levels of protection. Swimming is definitely not allowed in the whale watching area or where the whales are close. If you feel like you want to swim, close at camp, but as I mentioned, it's shallow. It's an area that you could potentially swim, but it's a lagoon, the visibility is not that great and the water is really cold. Okay, so that's one part of the question. The other one, can we touch the whales? The answer is yes. This is one of the only places in the world that actually you can do that. Um, and it is something that it happens. It is not something that um, happens every single time. When it happens, we never know. Uh, some of the whales are friendly, some of the whales are not. I always explain as people, some humans, we can be quite friendly, some humans, maybe we don't just don't like to interact a lot with others. And we see that with the whales, the ones that are friendly, they are the ones that tend to be friendly. We can identify that, them. And they just show up next to the boat, under the boat, they move the boat, they bring their heads out, the mom, you know, is resting, the calf comes and be curious and always splashing is encouraged and the whale is close and the captain, you know, is working everything for that unique and perfect moment of touching, you know, with the hand, the whale, the, the whale that is allowed. But it is really important to clarify that we're not going to be chasing the whales. We're there to witness, to see, to observe is whale watching. And if we have a friendly whale and it pops out, we're going to take advantage of that opportunity. But it's a special, unique moment when that happens. Mm. Can you talk a little bit more about what activities happen when you're not on the boat whale watching? Mm -hmm. So when we're not whale watching, um, two things are happening. We offer, and this is something tricky for me to, to mention because um, the whale watching excursions, even though we try to you know, to have one in the morning, one in the afternoon, sometimes because of weather conditions, and most of the time because of weather conditions, things change and all the plans change and the activities that we can offer are going to change because of that, okay? So something that maybe I mentioned here could be something that we don't end up doing because of the weather conditions. Um, but some of the options are we offer a, a beach, a nice, really nice kind of beach stroll because the, the, with these big differences of tides, uh, we have good opportunities for tide um, pulling uh, to observe and find marine invertebrates in between the rocks. There's a bunch of different types of shells, which I love. And so we always offer an interpretive walk, you know, through the beach with the shells, what kind of things, what kind of invertebrates we can find. 
go into the mangroves because the whale camp is right next to an opening of a mangrove uh, ecosystem right there. And then we go to that area and then we talk about the mangroves also. And it's a really nice area to, to walk. Now, next to uh, the Cabanas camp, it's the camping camp of Kojima also. And there's a little gift shop on that side, which is like a mile across. And then we offer a walk also. Um, all the way there, if you want to stretch your legs. Um, we have also an oyster, a sustainable oyster farm that is really close to the camp. And over there, the camp uh, takes us in vans and it's something that we schedule with time and, you know, depending on our schedule to visit uh, the group of women who work there and men also. And it's, it's an amazing uh, way of seeing, you know, the life that people have also. And we try to do that uh, to, for you know, to support that area for us to go and see it. And we pass through the little town, and then we explain what's the life of the people that live in the lagoon. Um, so that's another option that that we offer. But just to point out again that um, sometimes these activities are going to change, or we cannot do it because we have to squish, you know, things here and there. But in other times also, uh, we are going to be really packed with breakfast, well watching, lunch, break, uh, well watching and dinner. And then in between those little times is when we do these things. And of course, if you want to rest, you can always also uh, rest and enjoy the beautiful view of the camp. But those would be some of the activities. If we have in big interest of uh, mangroves and burden, we try to squish also before or after a whale watching a visit in the panga uh, towards the mangroves, okay? And then we go in with the right tide uh, to the mangroves to find some birds. So those those could be some of the options. Oh, sounds fabulous. Um, is seasickness a problem being out for hours at a time? And how would you mitigate that? Um, it really depends how sensitive you are um, because I've had most of the time it is not a big problem, but I've had a couple of guests that are really, really sensitive to to the motion of the ocean because when we stop, um, sometimes the boat is moving, you know, sideways and not up and down. Which with the up and down movement, most of uh, us uh, people we are good with it. But then when we stop looking for the whales, depending what's the activity, you know, there's some rocking on the sides and and people get a little bit dizzy. Um, and then Dramamine, Meclizin is kind of always good or whatever your, your doctor recommends uh, for you. I've seen guests that they bring everything. They bring the little kind of um, um, these little bands that you put, you know, here that they have like pressure points and, and then they take a pill and they are figuring out because it really depends how sensitive. In general terms, you know, the ocean, is kind of smooth of course we can have the really choppy days but actually on the really choppy days is when i've seen the less um i would say the less feeling drowsy or sick because we are always moving the boat is always moving and when we have a perfect calm day is like we have that just slow movement that is the one that gets uh some of our guests sick um i would say that actually be mind just think about when in the bus that's more of a problem actually the um, the whiny road because it's a it's a whiny road in a bus that uh i think our guests tend to feel more emotion sickness than sea sickness so i would bring something if you are sensitive to that for both mm. Okay. Um, what charging facilities are available at camp? Is there electricity? Is there Wi-Fi? Great question. Um, there is no Wi-Fi. There's only emergency Wi-Fi for, you know, emergency reasons, but there is no Wi-Fi um, for the public or anything like that, which is amazing. You can just unplug and enjoy, you know, <laughs> nature, honestly. Um, and then electricity, electricity wise at the cabanas, there is electricity. There is one light bulb with one switch. And if you have, for example, a CPAP, they can, um, connect 
a type of light bulb that has a um, like a plug there for you to connect your your machine, but that's only for that type of use. The general uh usage for charging is inside of the main palapa we have a charging station with many 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 plugs um for phones cameras gopros all of that type of equipment that in between well watching activities always we leave everything charging at night you can leave things there everything is super safe in that area so you don't have to worry about that um and this we do it um, just to be mindful of the usage of electricity because it's all created uh, by solar electricity and um, it is not in your room that you can just continue to charge everything. It's only at the at the palap. But again, for kind for the CPAP machines, that would be the only thing that you can charge, you can connect in uh, the cabana. Okay. All right. I think we have time for one more quick question. Um, are you allowed to remove empty shells from the beaches and bring them home? That's a fabulous question and sadly no. As I mentioned, it's a biosphere reserve, different levels of protection, World Heritage Site, uh, everything is happening there in protection and you, you're not allowed. You can take a beautiful picture. Sometimes we do collect them and, and we have like a little museum in the main palapa of that trip. You know, these are the things that we that we saw and then we have to we have to leave them there. Okay. Well, that is the last question we have for today, so I will hand it back to you for closing comments. Well, I I hope I'm going to see you this following season. Um I'm going to be guiding four trips of this of this season. If it's not this season and then in the future, I hope to see you here or any, you know, other questions that you may have, I'm sure that um, you know we can always reach out to NatHav, and, and I, I'm happy to to help if you need to you know to have some more clarification of, of anything. Okay, thank you, and I can I cannot wait to share the gray walls with all of you. Mm. Sophia, thank you again for taking the time to present to us today. I also want to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye.